Hey guys, Kevin is right for Scream Queen Season 1, Episode 7, Beware of Young Girls. And I was actually really looking forward to this episode. Episode 6, and it really impressed me, I have to tell you guys. I told you guys that Episode 6 was a great episode. I meant it when I said it was a great episode. It was a really surprising episode because of how great the humor was, how great the character moments were. It really felt like we were getting in the right place, and it really felt like we were finally getting to that place where, stuff, where a lot of stuff is actually going to be happening. And then you get to this episode... And, uh, this episode was very unusual, and it was, uh, I was quite upset with this episode, I have to tell you guys, because we've been on such a great streak lately. Episode 5 was really great, and then episode 6 was an amazing episode. This episode was actually quite boring. It was actually pretty filler, and about 90% of it really didn't need to even be in the show. I don't even know why this whole thing came up. I get what they were trying to do, but this was not the time to do this, and the storyline they had in this episode ended up making things actually very, very serious. This was not at all a fun episode, and uh, there are two stories. Now, I will say something I do like about this episode is that they did keep things to only two storylines, and they did focus on story rather than the characters, but the thing about this show that works so well, that works so well in episode 6, that the show realized that it's just, it's good when it just has fun with itself. When it doesn't take itself seriously, it can take itself seriously at some points, but for the most part, it needs to stay a fun show. It needs to stay a fun show where people get killed and there's a killer on the loose. That's what this show needs to be. Episode 7 is not what I want this show to be. This episode was boring. It was pretty tedious, I have to say. Most of what was going on in this episode was not necessary at all. And it had two plots, but they did not go together at all. I didn't think either of these plots really went together. And it really felt like two very different episodes. So let's get to the main plot here. The main plot of this episode was very unusual. I don't know why they decided to introduce this now. I get that we know, of course, that Gigi is working for the Red Devil. And obviously that, I, I understand that. But this didn't really feel like it was the time to necessarily do this episode. Especially after coming back from the World Series... This is not the way to come back. Like, when you come back from a break, you need to give me a big episode, and that is not what the show gave me. What it gave me is its weakest entry since Haunted House, which you guys know how much I hated Haunted House. And, uh... Let me say this, this is not one of the worst episodes the show has given us, it just is definitely one of the weird Scream Queens episodes. There are two kinds of Scream Queens episodes. There are episodes like Chainsaw, Pumpkin Patch, and uh, Seven, Minutes in, uh, Seven Minutes in Heaven, where they understand the show, and, uh, you know, Seven Minutes in Hell, where they understand the show, they understand the characters, and they just have fun with it. And then there are episodes like The Pilot, Haunted House, well, the pilot was just, the pilot was pretty terrible, but then there are episodes like Haunted House and this one, where the show actually takes itself pretty seriously, and it doesn't work. Like I said, this ep this this whole plot was kind of devoid of humor, and when there was humor, it wasn't very funny. Basically, Gigi, as we know, is working with the Red Devil, and uh, she gets called by who is most likely one of the Red Devils, and she tells them about the man that she wants to kill. You know, we still know that she wants to go after this man. And she's realizing that she might be starting to get, a, you know, people might be starting to get a bit suspicious. And she wants to take the lead off of them. So she goes to this shopping trip with Grace. By the way, guys, I'm not recapping this episode like I usually do because not too much happened in this episode. It was very filler. Um, but basically, she goes on this shopping trip with Grace, who I really did like this scene, I have to say. I like seeing Gigi um, have to change her wardrobe from her 90s clothes to new clothes. It was funny. Things like that, that's what I like about the show. And of course, we know that Gigi's a big phony, so that's why this is even the more funnier. And uh, Nazim Padrad is definitely doing a very good job. She's really creepy, but then once she puts on that happy face, I mean, that's Gigi is becoming one of my favorite parts of the show. She really is great in this role, I have to say. Um, definitely, she's really got into this character, you can tell. But, um... She basically tells Grace that there's, you know, there's this girl, Heather McCarthy, that was a Kappa student several years ago, and something clearly had to happen to her because she didn't graduate, and that's all she really knows about her, although we know that there's probably more she knows, you know, she's not just doing this to do this. But she says that Munch most likely is responsible for this, and 
she says her and Pete should go for this, which leads to a lot of scenes between Grace and Pete. If you guys can't tell, Grace and Pete investigation scenes are my least favorite part of this show. They're boring, they're formulaic, and they're not interesting. And we get about five of them in this episode, and they're very, very bland and very boring. And it's not because Diego Bonetta and Skylar um, Samuels are bad actors and actresses. In fact, I think they have really good chemistry. They have really good chemistry in this episode. There just wasn't much with, for them to work with in this episode, and it really sucked. Basically, they go to this girl, Heather. We get this extremely long flashback about how she was basically in love with Munch's husband, Steven. And uh, Steven was her Beatles professor, and I like how Heather, uh, you know, that Feather did make the fact, didn't make known the fact that um, uh, he was supposed to be... You know, he actually wasn't attractive, but she liked him because he was her Beatles professor and things like that. And they started a whole affair, which eventually led to Munch's and Steven's divorce. You know, Steven Wine asked Munch for a divorce. She then, like, broke her glass door. And by the way, guys, Munch, as I have said, has been a character I have been very in the middle with. There have been some episodes where I really like her and some episodes where I really dislike her. And this episode had both of them. I really... The ending of this episode, you know, I think I know how I feel about her character, but this whole episode, I'm like, do I like her or do I not like her? There are some scenes where Jamie Lee Curtis really shines, and then there's some scenes that really fall flat, and I think some really good examples of that um, was this flashback stuff. Everything in, these, in this flashback scene was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, and it wasn't funny at all. There was nothing funny about this, and uh, basically, she talks about how Munch basically then began stalking her. She wore the same clothes as her wherever she went and basically just started going after her in any, in any way she could. And then Steven eventually asked Heather to... I keep saying Heather, her name is Feather. Asked Feather to move in with him and basically she agreed to. But then one night she took a bubble bath because she had cramps and basically... She then saw this radio, and Munch supposedly tried to electrocute her, and uh, that's basically what happened with that. So she knows that Munch is crazy, and Munch apparently also got her kicked out of the campus. I mean, Munch, it clearly seems like this is something Munch would do, and uh, it was pretty, you know, you can just tell that Munch most likely is obsessed. You know, she's crazy. We've seen that she's crazy before. We've seen how obsessive she can be. And we've seen how selfish she can be. So it makes sense why Munch would do this. And uh, this necessarily, this isn't necessarily Heather's fault. Heather's fault. And it's not that I didn't care about this. It's not that I didn't um, think this plot was interesting. I just don't know if this was the show to tackle it. I mean, it's so generic. How many shows are we going to have of this person cheating on this person? There's nothing interesting about it. There's nothing different that this show does with it. And it became very, very boring very quickly. They just, they make no of this throughout the entire episode. The entire episode focuses on this, and it was very boring, I have to say. Now, I did find out that the reason um, her name was Feather um, was actually because of the song at the end of this episode, um, which apparently was trying to show the girl from Rosemary's Baby, the lead actress, she apparently... Um, is based on this whole storyline, which is interesting, but Ryan Murphy, why the fuck did you think you needed to put this into Scream Queens? I don't know. American Horror Story, I could understand, but why Scream Queens? What did this have to do with anything? I don't really know. They do think that maybe this could mean that Munch is connected to the killer, and then things get pretty crazy when Feather comes home and finds that Steven has been brutally murdered, and I mean, like, body parts all around the house with this, like, bloody trail all around the house his face is in the fish tank i mean that was pretty crazy but again i didn't care why because we've seen this character for a total of two minutes i don't care about his death it's that simple i don't care about his death i don't care that he was murdered and the show wants you to care and it damn well tries to get us to care that steven was murdered I did not give two shits i didn't care what happened to his character i just didn't care what was going on there and uh Basically, Munch is accused immediately of this, and basically they start to gather evidence, and they think that Munch very well could have done this, and right away, Chisholm ends up um, actually, you know, not listening, you know, actually sending her to the nut house. Now, this is what I didn't understand. Why would you send her to the insane asylum? If she is supposedly this killer, 
why the insane asylum? She has not proved that she is senile. She has not proved that she is crazy. I mean, a good detective. Yes, I get that Chislam is supposed to be a horrible detective and is supposed to be really lazy. I get that. But why the insane asylum? I mean, she wasn't crazy. The Red Devil is not crazy. The Red Devil is clearly aware of what they are doing. And there's no way, there's no reason for them to take them to the insane asylum. Prison is where they need to go. Not the asylum. Um, and I get it that we were trying to have Silence of the Lamb um, throwbacks and, you know, parodies and whatnot there. But again, it just felt like it only happened for that joke, and it was very one note, and I definitely did not like that. It doesn't stop there, though, because Munch, of course, is sent to the mental institution. She at first thinks that Chislam is fucking with her, but then she's freaking out, obviously, and uh, Grace and Pete go to find her, because they basically think that this case is over. They think that the case is over. They think that now that they know that Munch was the Red Devil, that everything's great, and... Uh, Here's the thing, though. There are two killers. Like, that's what I'm trying to think here. Did you not forget that there are two killers? It's not just Munch. I mean, clearly there's someone else working with her, and in no point do they bring up that there are two killers. I mean, that's a continuity issue right then there. That's not something I'm, you know, that I'm surprised about, because this is Ryan Murphy. Ryan Murphy doesn't know what continuity is, so I'm not surprised that we have continuity issues with that. But just in general, you're telling, you build up, you had this huge thing in the last episode where there being two killers, then you completely just regard it in this episode was really upsetting. I, I really hope that they fix that um, in the next episode. But basically, they visit Munch at this mental institution. We get some really bad um, throwbacks to Silence of the Lambs and some really bad um, even American Horror Story Asylum references. However, I did like the girl that's like, I paint everything. I paint everyone. That was actually pretty creepy. That I will say I liked. Munch, you can tell this entire scene is lying. You can tell she's lying through her teeth. You can just tell that nothing she's telling, she's saying is true. The only thing that got me to possibly believe that she was telling the truth is just how um, upset she was. You know, she did seem pretty, um, you know, vulnerable in these scenes. But again, you can just tell that Munch is putting on act. She seems like she's very good at it. And she basically tells them that she's not the one that did any of this. Feather is. They can't trust Feather whatsoever. And she even makes a deal with Grace, which I thought this was pretty well done. She makes a deal that if she finds out, you know, what Feather did, and if, if, you know, she, you know, shows evidence that Feather is in fact the killer of Steven, Thing is, though, how the hell would this make any sense? That's what I don't understand. Why would Feather kill Steven? There is nothing that shows that she is crazy. Feather's not crazy. We did not see one thing of her being crazy. And yes, I get that maybe she's hiding something, but there was nothing we saw that made her seem like a sociopath or a psychopath, and uh, I don't think that it just didn't very sound very plausible. However, Grace, being the idiot that she is, honestly, Grace was an idiot idiots in this episode and grace was getting pretty smart she really was but she was an idiot in this episode she for whatever reason believes munch goes along with this and um tells her that they're gonna free her so i don't know why but basically she does make a deal with grace that if she proves that feather is the killer that she will tell her who the baby in the bathtub was because that is their next case and that is a compelling deal i will say that the deal that she made with her i can understand why grace took it but how can you trust this woman? Honestly, how can you trust her? The fact that she opened up the campus again, even when people are getting murdered, she didn't care because it wasn't students from Kappa Kappa Tau. You shouldn't trust her. That should give you reason enough not to trust her. And Grace is really stupid. There are two sides of Grace. There is a side of Grace that's really um, funny, and then there's a side of, and witty, and then there's a side of Grace that's really fucking annoying and stupid. And this is and this whole episode we got that side of Grace, and this is the kind of Grace that I hate. I hated the Grace we got on this episode. I really did. Um, for whatever reason, Grace and Pete believe that she's telling the truth. Pete, not necessarily. He knows that she is the one that did this, and he doesn't believe one second of it. But then they go to the crime scene, because basically what they decide to do is to get some sort of DNA from Feather um, to basically match hers, and they decide to use her toothbrush. So basically, Pete gets pictures from Chislam, 
and they look into these pictures, and they see a half-eaten bologna sandwich. Now, before, Munch had been complaining about bologna sandwiches, and how she didn't like them very much, so they decide that this can't be her, because clearly she did not like bologna sandwiches, so this has to be Feather, and they realize that this very well is Feather, so... Basically, make a long story short, Feather is arrested for the murder, taken to an asylum, and uh, Munch is released, um, which, again, not that interesting. Very formulaic. You guys can tell there's really not much. This is very, like, repetitive. There's really not much going on here. Um, so, basically, that's all that happens there. Chislam says he's going to try to get some answers, and Munch tells Grace that if she wants to run out the identity of the baby to meet her, to meet up with her um, tomorrow because she's busy. So I, I'm guessing we're going to find out next week who the baby in the bathtub is, obviously. But again, I don't trust Munch mainly because of the ending scene. The ending scene of this episode is some of the best stuff this show has given us. I will say that. As bad as this episode was, as much as a filler episode as this was, the ending scene is what really paid off. The ending scene of this episode was truly great. I love the last three minutes of this episode munch has this whole monologue about how she did kill she did in fact kill steven she enjoyed every minute of it she had this very long elaborate plan which i actually thought was very smart and uh she framed feather and the song that they played beware of young girls um showed why this you know was perfect i thought that whole song they played was great i loved it one of the best parts of the episode by far. I mean, in an otherwise shitty episode, that was a really great way to end it with that monologue. It shows that you can't trust Munch. It shows that she's a villain and she's a badass. And I love that, I have to say. I mean, I don't necessarily... But the thing that I don't like about this is that they want you to feel bad for Munch. They want you to feel like she's taken down Feather. Feather didn't do anything wrong, okay? she Yes, she had an affair with Steven, but he was the one that wanted to have the affair with her. She liked him, and it really... I don't understand why the show wants us to, like, sympathize with Munch. That really is what it came across as to me. I know like I was saying, well, none of the characters in the show you're supposed to sympathize with. It just seemed like the way it was coming across, that's what they wanted, and I definitely did not like that. But overall, this plot was very boring, and it's mainly because of how great the subplot to this episode is, because the subplot is amazing to this episode. The subplot is what this entire episode should have been. In fact, everything going on with Chanel and Hester and, um, you know, all of them is great. I loved all the stuff we got there. Problem is, because of how much they focus on Munch, we barely get anything there. Basically... Um, they have finally decided to have a funeral for Chanel number two. Chanel basically says how much she hates Chanel number two and how much of a lying backstabber she was and how she didn't really like Chanel very much. And they say goodbye to her. And the Chanel's can tell that Chanel is very bitter over the test. She's not taking it very well. So they decide that she needs to communicate with Chanel number two to maybe mend fences between them. And they get this idea of using a Ouija board. The best laugh of the episode comes in this scene. The only scene that actually made me laugh in this episode was in this scene. I love the scene where uh, where Hester's, you know, where, where uh, basically Chanel says, oh, the board doesn't work. And Hester says, oh, haven't you seen the movie? And, and, and Chanel's like, oh, the movie Ouija? Yeah, nobody saw that. I thought that was great because, yeah, nobody nobody saw Ouija. I mean, I know people from my school, they even admit that Ouija's terrible. Even though there's a sequel coming out, I think that was a hilarious joke, and that kind of stuff I love. That is great. The way the show is willing to make fun of horror movies is awesome, and at least Ryan Murphy knows what a good horror movie is and what a bad horror movie is. That I definitely really do like, I have to say. I thought that was definitely very funny. So, Basically, they decide to contact Chanel number two. They're not sure if it's really her. They start asking her really weird questions. And once again, Chanel asks if number five has a vagina for teeth. I don't know why she keeps asking this question. I think it's a question the world or may never know because she keeps asking it. And uh, I think that's going to be a regular thing. But then they get to the big stuff because Chanel number two basically spells out for them that Chad is cheating on Chanel. And obviously, Chanel is really pissed at Chad. It was inevitable that Chad was going to do this because this is Chad we're talking about. And uh, Chad in this episode, I really, I have to say, guys, I thought he was a bit out of character. Not necessarily out of character, but this was just weird. I mean, Chad with this animal was very strange. I thought this whole scene was very weird. 
I usually love Chad scenes, but this was probably one of my least favorite scenes of the episode, to be honest with you. Mainly because Chad, I don't think, had enough in this episode. I know a lot of people don't like Chad, but I just find him hilarious because everything he says is great. And I think um, Glenn Powell, like I said, is just having a lot of fun with this character. This, uh, this scene in particular, though, was very weird. I did not like it at all. Basically, what happens here is Chad is lactose and makes up this story that he's lactose intolerant. And basically, Chanel finds him with this um, goat that he supposedly is having sex with. I, I don't know, but uh, he makes up this story that the goat is actually there because he's lactose intolerant and the goat's milk is good for him because he needs the proper calcium so that he can have a fit body. And Chanel obviously buys this because she's an idiot. She'll listen to anything that Chad says. I've, be I've believed this by now. You know, Chanel will listen to anything Chad says and whether it's true or not, they have sex and that's where that goes. So nothing really happens with that. So Chanel basically plans on getting revenge on Chanel number two. They decide to once again, and this, we don't see this plot for like a lot of time. So when we get back to it, I, it felt like another episode. It really did. This entire thing felt like another episode because this is what Scream Queens is. That whole thing with Munch, I don't know what the hell that is. That's something else that I don't want the show to be. This is what Scream Queens is. Everything going on in this was great. Basically, they decide to contact Chanel number two again with the Ouija board, and, um, they basically are asking her some questions, um, and Ch they can tell that it's her, but then the big question comes out, which is Chanel asks, um, number two, who is the killer, and number two says that it's her! Chanel is the killer, which gets all the Chanel's to basically turn their back on Chanel, and Hester basically comes up with this plan that in order for this to work, they need to kill Chanel, they need to kill her, do whatever they can to, uh, make sure that she's dead, and they come up with some really brutal ways, but it seems like they're going to agree to it, but then things kind of take a turn, because Chanel takes some, um, Prozac, basically, I think it was Prozac that she took, and because of her taking this Prozac, it knocks her out, and she sees a vision of Chanel number two basically talking to her from beyond the grave, and she tells her how terrible hell is, and things like that. They had some really weird jokes, like with Hitler and, uh, some Bin Laden. Not funny, honestly. None of that was funny. However, Ariana Grande was great in this episode. I thought she was really great here. I thought she was definitely very funny. My only thing is that she was only back because she wanted to come back. So basically, Ryan Murphy just wrote this in because she wanted to come back, and I under- I think it's fine that they did that, but- you killed her off. Like, I don't need to see your character again. I did find the scene... Uh, ne I did find the scene necessary, but it just felt like, you know, they only did this because Ariana Grande wanted to come back. But basically, she tells Chanel that the only way for her to go to heaven is for her to mend fences with Chanel. She apologized for to Chanel for everything she did and tells her how she's jealous and how she always wanted to be like her. It was actually a really touching scene, and uh, it was it was funny, though, as, as well. And Chanel, number two, basically tells her straight out that all the Chanel's are playing on murdering her, and they're going to do it in the most graphic way possible. Basically, while she's asleep, they're going to get a bowling ball, bash her head in with a bowling ball. I mean, I, I kind of want to see that, to be honest with you guys. That's kind of the violence that I know that's kind of sick, but this show is really good when it has really hard hardcore violence. I mean, you guys saw Chainsaw. You know how violent the show can be. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually showed that. You know Chanel's not gonna die, though. She's, like, the second main character of this show. You know it's not gonna happen. But, obviously, she's not gonna die. What ends up happening after this is that Chanel basically finds out what the Chanel's are gonna do. She makes a pact that they don't do this. And, uh, basically, Chanel tell number two tells her not to take her anger on them, for, or for, but for her to be the bigger person. And that's exactly what Chanel does. She decides to basically get them all presents. She gets them all presents, which are a magnifying glass and a Sherlock Holmes hat to basically prove that Grace and Zayday are the killers. So what they're gonna do is, basically, they have now turned on Grace and Zayday, thinking that they're the killers, while basically Grace and Zayday think that they're the killers, and that basically is how this episode ends. So overall, guys, as you can tell, a very filler episode. Really not too much to say about it. I mean, we already knew Dean Munch was crazy. That's nothing new. We knew that. We already knew that Gigi was working with the Red Devil. That's nothing new. The Red Devil is not even in this episode. This is the first episode where we haven't seen the Red Devil at all. I was really pissed off. I mean, we haven't seen the Red Devil at all in this episode. Come on! Come on, I want to see some Red Devil action. This was the problem with the Scream MTV TV series. They took way too many breaks and no kills. But 
it looks like next week that people are going to get killed and it's going to get really crazy, which I'm definitely looking forward to. Hopefully next week is a big improvement. This episode was very disappointing. It wasn't necessarily a terrible episode. It wasn't very good. I will say that was a very, very much a step down, very much a step down from uh, the momentum that we've had in the past two weeks. Definitely a step down. But overall, guys, let me know what you guys thought of this episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Definitely let me know what you thought of it. Did you find this episode to be very unnecessary? I found the main plot extremely unnecessary, but I did find the subplot quite interesting. I wish the rest of the episode would have been as good as the subplot because, I, like I said, the subplot was very good. It was just the main plot that really killed the episode for me. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode. I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for a movie review. Yes, I will be doing a movie review. I, I haven't done one in so long, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.